The Susan Brenda Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brender here with my co-host Sean Flynn and our contributing expert Colonel Mike Brown on PTSD first responders and I'm so pleased that I'm here with my team and you know today guys we're going to be talking about PTSD the ramifications of it what it really it is and some of the solutions that we have to deal with when we're talking about this horrendous disease so Sean why don't you jump in and introduce Colonel Mike Brown again and give him the first question that is about the solutions that you might have if, for our audience. Thank you again, Susie. Again, um, Colonel Mike Brown, thank you again to have a 31-year retired colonel here in this environment. Again, another important service call. Susie, you're the dispatcher. Today, I'm sitting in the lineup room today while Colonel Mike is at the podium. He has the lead. He's our field training officer. He's going to take us on this very important service call today. And again, to reiterate my definition of PTS, unprocessed trauma. For us as first responders, it's the things that don't fit. As Mike, Colonel Mike Brown has talked about in the past, there's a human cost to the oath that we took and over time, there becomes a legitimate injury, invisible wounding. Those that are out there listening, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Mike Brown. But again, I'll reiterate that PTS, unprocessed trauma, becomes an invisible wounding. And Colonel Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can help us today as we go through this important service call to anybody that out there might be listening that might need to hear this so that we can be of service to them. Colonel Mike, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Susie, for bringing me back. Um, we all know the end result of some of the PTSD is causing a very uh, traumatic impact on our warriors that are coming back from the field. You know, the co-occurrence of PTSD, you know, moral injury, traumatic brain injuries, and depression, uh, returning warriors with substance abuse problems will require future innovations for optimal treatment. You know, furthermore, we do not have enough national, state, and local attention being placed on this epidemic, which is plaguing our nation. You know, so it's therefore very imperative that we continue to raise the concern of the epidemic going on in America. And that's so important. And one of the reasons why we're here today, why this show is so important, and why everything you've done so far, Sean, uh, and you and Susie uh, bringing this to the forefront, this is a balanced show. We're not we're not holding back, but also we're not just complaining about it. We're just bringing the problems to the audience or the listeners here today. We're actually bringing solutions, solutions to the table that we want to hear not just the listeners, but targeting in on those people that have uh, an opportunity that in leadership positions around the country to make a difference. And here's what's troubling with me, and that's a metric. You know, a metric is a quantitative answer that businesses use across the nation. A bank will not give you a loan unless you give them a metric by which their investment is going to make a difference. And I tell you what, Sean, Susie, I've been around. I've been around for the last four or five years. And one thing I haven't seen is a metric on the investment that all these strategies have been putting together around the nation, from hospitals to the national strategy to the state strategies, and even at these nonprofits. What is the metric are you basing your investment on? So the first thing I want to talk about, why can't we define a metric that shows the improved outcomes? What's the outcome? Reduce the number of suicides, right? Fund only research projects, if we're going to look at the research side of the house, like we talked about the last two shows, that follow and comply with international scientific designs and research standards producible results. This is that spiritual and medical research, the two sides coming together. 
don't fund them unless they're going to come together. And when they do come together, that their research is providing a reasonable uh, and reproducible result. We're talking about solutions today. Um, one of the things I like to talk about, and I'm going to direct this question or answer to the question, is to our clinical care teams out there. I want you to look at the stages of recovery for a veteran. Why? Because it's important that you understand a veteran is unique. Why is he unique? Because of what he has done. It's unlike anything else that you may have been trained to do in college or your experiences uh, with other patients. He must go through three phases, safety, mourning, and reconnection. Got to be in that order. It's got to be in that order for us to recover. Those are the stages we must go through. See, we are broke. We are fighters. We will fight this. So don't take advantage of us just because we are taking a knee. See, that's what we do. We're ready to go to the next round, but we have to take a knee first. We are warriors. We will be back. And we know those that are trying to take advantage of us. If you try to take advantage of us, I'm telling you this, we will resist you give you my own personal experiences. I went to a rehab in Texas. The staff overdosed me. I went to a social worker in another rehab and they bullied me and tried to humiliate me in a group environment. I went to another rehab. Do you get what I'm talking about? I've been through a lot of rehabs. This rehab stabbed me, literally stabbed me with a needle for pain medicines. The needle broke off and the morphine was running down my leg. See, they wanted to have control over me just to inflict pain. Just so you know, we are warriors. Treat us. You can't break me. You can't break us. We were born free and we fought for our freedoms. All we ask is for you to be kind to us. Shock therapy or excessive control will only isolate us more. Your recovery rate, treatment centers out there in America, in a clinical setting, this is a fact. See, this show is about facts. It's not about opinions. 20 to 30 percent success rate what don't you get i want you to get that so we're talking about ptsd today it's one of those deliberating disorders affecting military service members you know what the end state is suicide of those seeking treatment for PTSD, only 20 to 30 percent fully recover, making the development of more effective intervention in research should should be a public priority number one. We got the pandemic going on right now, which is public priority number one. So why is suicide amongst veterans not a priority? I don't know. I don't understand it at all. But we need to do something about it. Therefore, I think there's a solution. And we've talked about this in our other shows, about the medical solution, about the spiritual solution. There is a need for empirically based individual treatment for PTSD that targets not just PTSD, but the moral injury that makes explicit use of patient spiritual resources, particularly given the evidence where in a recent multiple study that 75% of this study, and it's a small study, this is where I'm trying to get to, 
when you get to a large study, but in this small study of uh, 425 veterans indicated that the religion was very important in their lives. And over 80% of this study indicated this for spirituality, that, that this was important for PTSD. So why aren't we addressing this in our medical research? I've been across the nation and all I've gotten was medical PTSD therapy, not once spiritual. It's alarming. Here's what I wanna to talk to you about here right now. I'm gonna give you a little scenario and this scenario is gonna resonate I know amongst my military buddies, Sergeant James. Sergeant James is a convoy commander. He's going to MSR Tampa. And my veterans know where MSR Tampa is in Iraq. And he's traveling up and down the road. And he's got a, and that white Toyota coming down that road. And that white Toyota, all he sees is a man in there. And he's honking and trying to get this guy to stop, but he won't stop. And he has to make a decision. And that decision is take him out. So what does he do? He's a young man, 26 years old. He's got six vehicles behind him. And all he's been taught was white Toyota is in danger. And he takes him out, runs him off the side of the road into a culvert. It flips a couple times. And as he passes by, shocking and horror to his belief, there's a woman and two children in the back seat. They're upside down. He doesn't know the state. He can't stop. And then the rest of the convoy goes by. That's a moral injury. To him, they probably died there. They probably drowned. Or they just died of their injury. See, it's a thing that Sergeant James can't shake from his mental mental mind. He's living with it. Hell, he's only been out of high school eight years. And he just probably killed a man and her wife and two children. So I guess what I'm going to get down to is spiritual injury, moral injury, PTSD, you come home, And what do you do? Well, only 20 to 30% survive, right? What's that leave for the other 70%? Suicide. Death. And what's society doing about it? Nothing. And what they are doing about it is ignoring it. And what can we do about it? Well, I gave you some solutions at the beginning of the show. And we're going to give you more as the show goes on. I'm Colonel Mike Brown. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for the, the response that you gave us and some of the solutions that you suggested. Let me step in for a second. Um, as I listen to you talk about this, what comes to mind is we're dealing with the COVID-19 now, the pandemic. Do you think that the government and the people who really need to hear what you have to say are ignoring you because of this pandemic? I tell you what, I just got an email today and it was disturbing, Susie. And why was it disturbing? Well, a leading uh, head agency down here whose primary purpose and mission is to treat wounded warriors on these invisible wounds of war. And I'm talking a agency that promotes that they are a national standard of excellence. And the governor of the state of Massachusetts 
called this head agency and took their commander off post to go and run one of these mobile hospitals for the pandemic. That just sent a signal over the bow that the pandemic has taken over the epidemic. Can you imagine that? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it sure does. Sean, um, what, do you, what do you think? What do you attribute to the fact that the government really started to listen years ago? Because we started hearing about PTSD a number of years ago, but now, again, it's not really mentioned anymore. There's got to be more of a reason than this pandemic. Um, why? What do you think, Sean? Well, once again, um, I'm going to speak from my experience. And again, I always put the disclaimer out there that I, I qualify as a former first responder. Um, I am not a doctor. I'm not attached to any of my former agencies. I'm not a counselor. But from my personal experience, I will say this. I see a little bit of hope because I was able to speak to some leaders the highest leader from my former agency and we had a discussion and he understood at that point during that conversation that what's happening now when a first responder comes in and raise their hands and asks for help that what they're doing now what happens is is the first responder then gets sent home and gets left alone how does this tie into the the pandemic. Well, what happens in PTS? See, isolation is a very, very dangerous place with this disease. And with this kind of suffering, uh, that old system, let me just say this, this is what I went through. As I reached out for help, that's what happened. I got sent home and I was by myself. And I really do believe that there are leaders out there, I have some hope, um, that it's important that we change this narrative and we recreate the paradigm. One of the things that needs to be done, and, and he understood this, was to start developing an in-house wellness program with peer-to-peer -peer network in conjunction with medical professionals that can not just abandon the wounded person that's suffering, but give them a, a more practical opportunity to actually address what they're going through. Let me just give you an example. I've been a first responder since 2000, I'm not attached to any agencies right now. And when it's time for us to heal in PTS, it's important that we feel safe. It's important that we can trust the people that we speak to. It's important that there's an environment created to where we can open up to start really getting down to what's going on. So to answer your question, from my personal experience, when it comes to law enforcement agencies, fire departments, I think what has to happen is, is that we actually have to change the, the approach to helping the suffering individual. And somehow we have to create rehabilitation within the agencies to where we don't abandon the first responder and just leave them hanging out in a situation where they're in isolation. Now, I wish I was more prepared for this question, but I think I'm on the right track. And I will say this, my former boss, I believe understands this. And now to have compassion for the agencies, this whole paradigm is gonna take, as Mike said in a couple of shows before, it's gonna take a collective effort to not ignore this true situation that first responders are out there suffering from PTS and it's growing in its building and it's going to lead to death. It's going to lead to a situation where that first responder eventually suffers so much that it could lead to the end of that person's life. And if we don't address this fact and start creating internal wellness programs and an environment of trust to also include anonymity to protect the, the first responder, that is going to take a huge collective effort. And if that gets ignored, like it is getting ignored right now, I will tell the truth. Here's what's going to happen. First responders are going to die from this disease, whether it's going to be a slow, gradual death, and they're going to become 
inefficient employees and the citizens are going to not get the service that they uh, are paying for. Okay. And the other thing is you can have this philosophy of, well, we'll just abandon them. We'll just um, send them to a doctor, an outside contracted doctor, and we'll just basically put a fork in them, which means that we'll just claim that they're not fit for duty. We'll let them go and we'll hire a bunch of new guys to come in and the cycle is going to start again because what's going to happen is after a certain amount of years and they take on the toll that you take on as a first responder you're going to have the same problem and the same vicious cycle i apologize that i got a little long-winded on that i'm not completely prepared but i i i, I want to let mike also colonel mike brown respond to what i just said yes yeah, sean i think it's uh you were actually not being well prepared that was a great answer to a long question because this is not easy it's a complex problem you know and every one of our veterans I, I could actually say every one of our veterans and first responders uh, who volunteer for military service or who volunteer to be a first responder were assessed and certified as being of normal physical and mental health upon entering their field that's correct right Sean 10-4 yeah therefore each member uh, whether they're going to be discharged should be assessed for PTSD and I always add in their moral injury uh, if found to have a diagnosis should be compensated and have benefits and clinical care set up prior to them to be discharged and I'm just going to add on to that uh, prior to being released from uh, their position if they were a first responder it's the fair thing to do you know I was a young kid Mike Brown was a young kid, 17 years old, December 27, 1984, when he walked into a processing center to enlist in the United States military. And I was of well mind. And 31 years later, I walked out and I was of ill mind. You know, and this is one of those solutions, Susie, you asked me to talk about. Yes. That you can't put me back on the street, broken in spirit and mind, but they are. And then they think that the Veterans Administration who gets all the heat from the street because we're of ill mind when we get out there and they think the VA is the sole solution to this problem. Listening to that story, I, I, I'm just, I, I don't have words for that. That is why we're doing what we're doing, because it's important that we start doing something about the truth of what's happening to our veterans and to our first responders, the firemen, the paramedics, the people on the front line. They are worth it. And what's happening, we know, is not putting a dent in the epidemic. Colonel Mike, can you take it home? action that we are looking for those are second chances that make an impact on america my goodness here's what i got to say now each day we lose 22 veterans to suicide and i tell you of my service that i do with the army young males 30 and under are three times more likely to suicide back to your question Susie, is the covid 19 pandemic is shattering the suicide epidemic in america amongst our young sons and daughters of this nation who serve this country. Yet they are dying at home at their own hands. Leave this with the audience. The forecast for 2020 in this country, this country alone, is that we will lose over 70,000 veterans to suicide. Enough is enough. It's unacceptable. Thank you again, gentlemen, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. God bless you for what you do.